Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, very welcome to the World Health Summit and this digital track named the Sexual Trauma Pandemic. My name is Klaus Michael Bayer. I'm a physician and sexologist working at the Charité, the University Hospital of Berlin. And at our outpatient clinic, we um, basically deal with the whole spectrum of sexual disorders and are very often confronted with survivors of sexual violence who, for example, are help seeking because of sexual dysfunctions or severe difficulties within their partnership. And in our forensic department, we are confronted with potential or real offenders in order to prevent offending against children. And I must say, sexual violence against children and women represents a severe global health problem. And as such, it is still not well enough appreciated. Although by now, data clearly shows that the victims reveal marked long-term effects which contribute to health problems. Good reasons to, invent, to invest in uh, prevention, but in this regard, we should broaden our scope and understand child sexual abuse and exploitation as a global pandemic, which might be an appropriate perspective. I would like to share a figure and explain this idea. I hope you can see this and uh, just look at the prevalence data on the left uh, hand side and the trauma follow-up costs for the society. These are calculations for Germany. And then <clears throat> it would be um, important to see at the causes, the transmission path and the victims and survivors. It's an international relevant pr problem. We need to think about the causes. Who might be interested in acting out sexually against children or consuming explicit child sexual exploitation material? And we do have good knowledge about the causes as well as the causes. So it's necessary to focus on this part. And we will do this in our session with two speakers, with Janvi Jan Doshi and Maximilian von Heiden. And then we have to focus on the transmission paths. Uh, here, of course, we are looking at the internet and see countless opportunities of getting into contact virtual, virtual. This accelerates the process of consuming, possessing, and contributing child sexual exploitation material. Obviously, we have to think about how to stop these transmissions used by courses, which they would not use if they were not there. We have two excellent speakers to focus on this uh, point, uh, Susie Hargreaves and David Miles. And then we will come up with um, uh, focusing on victims and survivors. So this is an important topic because we know a lot about the long-term consequences. We have a huge vulnerability in victims and you can see here mental, uh, psychiatric, uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, metabolic diseases could be long-term uh, follow. And so I'm very happy that Berit Kieselbach will share their data from the WHO. And at the end, we have to discuss perspectives and Stephen Sean from the uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt Foundation uh, will do this for us. So six excellent uh, speakers are with us today and I will introduce each of each one uh, to you just before the presentation. Then we will have time to discuss results concerning each pillar. After each pillar, we have a short time for discussion and eventually we will have the opportunity of a mutual discussion with all panelists. So let us start with the first pillar. Uh, courses, and I'm really happy that Janvi Doshi is joining us. Uh, she is an independent mental health professional from Mumbai with over 12 years of insightful experience, especially in the area of child sexual abuse. And currently, she acts as a consultant therapist with the Don't Offend India, a program, an initiative to reduce child sexual abuse by working with those sexually attracted to children. 
She's also a lecturer on the International Certification Program on Disexuality Therapy. So thank you for joining us, Janvi, and please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Bio. I'm just gonna start my presentation. Uh, I'm from Mumbai, India, as Dr. Bio mentioned, and India is a hotbed of child sexual abuse cases. It, I mean, according to the National Crime Record Bureau, in 2020 alone, 46,500 cases of sexual violence against children were recorded. That's 120 children each day. Okay? Even the Child Line India Foundation, which runs a helpline for uh, support for children, reported a 50% spike in calls in just 11 days of the lockdown when it was initiated in March 2020. And the situation for child pornography material is grim too. In a global compilation of reports of child sexual abuse material, India was right on top of the list with 11.7% of the reports. In actual numbers, that's not over 19 lakh reported images uploaded from India. And that's not even data about browsing or downloading or storage of material. And that just tells us how massive the situation and the problem is, how quickly we need to work on it. Because like Dr. Bayer pointed out, it is a pandemic. And this is all of this data is for reported cases. We can only venture a guess as to how many of these are going to be reported. And many of these child victims of course, maybe opportunities for adults to manifest their power, right? But at least a few, as we now know, are a result of sexual preference disorder called pedophilia. Individuals who have a sexual preference for children and may act in accordance to that. And that's where our program, Don't Offend India, steps in. We provide assessment and treatment for individuals with pedophilia and to prevent them from acting out on their fantasies. The idea is to help them manage their uh, preferences, manage the distress that may come out of their preferences and manage their behavior so as to not engage in any sexually exploitative behavior, including using of child pornography material. We started in 2016 and laid the groundwork for providing both online and offline services. Uh, currently, services are available in two cities in the country, in Mumbai and Pune. But very quickly, we also recognize that because of the mandatory reporting law that we have, this is not going to be enough. We will, considering how massive the country is and how much of a legal implication or uh, difficulty it is uh, for people to reach out to us, just off offline treatment on the two sides is not enough. Uh, and that's, a lot. that's when uh, our knowledge partner, the tool that they have developed, TroubledDesire.com, came to our rescue. Uh, Troubled Desire uh, was developed by the prevention project Dunkelfeld in Germany to provide people who are sexually attracted to children an online confidential anonymous platform for both self-diagnosis as well as for management. And in India, we are now using it in three languages, which has, I have to admit, really expanded the reach outreach of the program. In, from November 2018 to currently, over 800, so 815, nine people have actually accessed the tool and 101 of them have completed the session. But this data, and the pandemic that got to us in March 2020, where the lockdown happened, which means all of our services, offline services, were completely shut, motivated us to figure out other ways to be able to reach out to people. I mean, two cities with a few therapists in a massive country like India does not work. And that's when the idea of a virtual network came up. Currently, we are actually training 10 therapists across the country to be able to handle all of the load that, make, that comes in from Trouble Desire to provide services, confidential, safe, accurate, appropriate services for people with pedophilia. 
the goal, ultimate goal is to ensure that they have trained professionals that they can reach out to, and also that they are not acting out on their impulses. That's the goal. We're trying to prevent child sexual abuse through a technique that nobody else in India has tried before. Thank you, Dr. Bayer. Thank you, John V, for your presentation. And the idea is now to combine it with the presentation of Maximilian. Maximilian von Heiden will tell us something about European perspectives for course related prevention and as a new um, initiative, Don't Offend Switzerland. And uh, his background is in public health and social work. And uh, he has research experience in medical psychology and sexology. And currently, he is the director of health communication and public relations at the Institute of Sexology at the Charité. So, Maximilian, please go ahead. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, about causal related prevention. And uh, it is certainly a European perspective that I will give given the higher resources available for uh, prevention and healthcare in general. And um, uh, nevertheless, I'd like to give some perspectives for global health in the context of primary prevention of child sexual abuse. So um, some context here, but I won't dive too deep into it. Um, here, an international study on the prevalence of child sexual abuse worldwide. Um, so in a, a recent meta-analysis, uh, prevalence estimates range from 8 to 31% for girls and 3 to 17% for boys, which is um, a major public health issue, given the potential, and I'd like to underline the aspect potential, severe and long-lasting consequences, with here 14 reviews uh, being um, um, studied with more than 270,000 subjects, and there is clear evidence that survivors um, are significantly at risk of a wide range of medical, psychological, behavioral, and sexual disorders. And this, of course, should motivate us uh, to implement <clears throat> some, something in the context of primary prevention, instead of just taking care of victims, which are underserved at the moment as well. But who are the perpetrators? And this is really an important question, also for uh, designing primary prevention services. And what you see here is that, unfortunately, most cases of child sexual abuse remain unreported, so they are unknown to the justice system, and um, only a fraction is reported. And here at the intersection, and this is very important for the approach developed in Germany and currently uh, implemented in some European countries, is that not all cases of child sexual abuse are due to sexual preference disorders like pedophilia or hemophilia, which are ICD and DSM diagnosis. Um, this may be surprising to some people. And so I'd like to give some context about pedophilia. It's unfortunately, most people assume that anyone who's sexually interested in children would act upon that interest when an opportunity becomes available. So most people equalize pedophilia and child sexual abuse. And most people assume that no individuals would have sexual contact with the child unless they were sexually attracted to, to children but both is not the case. So even thorough police and child welfare investigations that have been conducted show that some pedophiles are found to have no history of, of sexual contacts with children. In Germany, it is about 50% of those um, who are reported to the justice system who have that diagnosis. So we have to uh, learn that pedophilia while it is a diagnosis, it, it does not necessarily lead to sexual abuse, but it is certainly a risk factor for abuse and the use of child sexual abuse material and for recidivism. And the prevalence is about 1% of the male population. And this 1% is very important. It may be considered a rare disease, although not everybody suffers or acts upon their impulse or would not necessarily qualify for a diagnosis, but this translates to 250,000 people alone in Germany and 1 million people in the USA and a global uh, population uh, that is affected would be 23 million. So this also underlines why there is such a huge demand and exchange of child sexual abuse material if you understand that uh, um, a, a significant proportion 
of the global population has that specific interest and uh, logically searches for such content online. And um, so I'd like to show uh, the case study of Kein Täter werden, which is um, a primary prevention approach developed here at the Institute of Sexology and Sexual Medicine in Berlin in 2005 um, with uh, private funding. And um, it was the first yeah, treatment project for self-identifying unreported pedophilic individuals with the goal, of course, to support them to integrate socially and at the same time to not act upon their impulses in order to prevent child sexual abuse and the use of child abuse material. And uh, there, due to its success, there, um, there was a successive establishment of 11 treatment sites, mostly at university hospitals in Germany, and it is currently under external evaluation uh, as part of a model project where this kind of anonymous treatment is funded as part of the statutory health insurance system in Germany. So although it is crime prevention at on the one hand, we don't want to stigmatize, um, especially those who have not done anything illegal. It is at the same time also healthcare, uh, given the fact that it, it is an ICD and DSM diagnosis. And here's some figures on the current status. And numbers are increasing due to its kind of normalization that this service exists and that people are approaching it. So um, 12,000 people contacted um, the service. And given it's a very strict inclusion criteria, not everybody was offered treatment. Other people were, for example, because they were currently under a legal investigation, were forwarded to, to other services. But a total of 2,314 individuals were offered treatment. Um, and um, we had patient inquiries from over 40 countries. And this is important because uh, what are the global perspectives? We have heard something about the Don't Defend India approach. Given the fact that this is a therapeutic approach, of course, uh, countries with limited health uh, resources um, and a low general physician or therapist density may not be able to um, implement such, such a treatment intense approach. Um, and so also uh, an online service was developed called Trouble Desire. We'll show some figures too. And currently we're uh, having a model project here in one federal state uh, of Germany uh, offering remote therapy. And what is specific about this approach in general is that it is uh, offered anonymously and free of charge because there's very high stigma of pedophilia or uh, associated with pedophilia. People may fear for their lives, for their families, for everything, even if they never did anything illegal, never abused a child or used child abuse material. So um, offering the service on a very low barrier is, is key. And in this remote therapy uh, service, for example, we had 74 inquiries uh, alone in one uh, in the past year. So um, compared to the Indian figures, it also shows that the cultural framework is very important and um, maybe resources, other structural barriers, but also uh, the guarantee of uh, patient therapist confidentiality because there's no mandatory reporting in Germany uh, in a comparable way to like for example, Commonwealth countries. And what we are very happy about is that there has been um, uh, an, the inauguration of a sister network like the German one in Switzerland um, as part of a longer political process, uh, which started with um, politicians asking why is, it, why is there no cause related prevention service available? And then they conducted um, a scientific review and they concluded that something similar uh, um, to our approach here in Germany should be established. And this is what's currently happening. And there are other European initiatives as well uh, looking for um, course-related prevention uh, services. Here's some figures on trouble desire. On average, we have a thousand users from more than 40 countries a month. And um, uh, about a fifth of these people stay longer than 10 minutes, indicating that they actually are interested in the contents and not just you know, having a look at the website. 6% stay longer than 30 minutes. Um, here, just some figures about where these users come from. So this is certainly a global interest. It's available in 11 languages at the moment, will be available in far more, uh, also um, global southern uh, countries. And so my summary, as I have been talking a lot, we think that early and evidence-based intervention is key, especially in risk groups. And risk groups exist like, and can be identified like people that have pedophilia or hemophilia as a diagnosis or potentially could be diagnosed with, but they shouldn't be stigmatized just for their condition, but of course, for their behaviors. 
if, if, if at all. And prevention and law enforcement um, complement each other. Of course, we don't see a, um, um, a problem here. And therapeutic prevention requires a specific legal and cultural framework. It is relatively cost intensive. So we have to look at other opportunities as well for prevention. And mobile health may be a building block to overcome structural barriers and increase access to treatment services. I'd like to close with a, a little chart from Michi and colleagues, um, you know, showing the different levels where, where behavior could be influenced. And um, as, as you may have learned through this pre uh, presentation, you know, training, enablement, uh, and all these more behavioral aspects, education, um, are just building blocks of a larger uh, prevention framework. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maximilian. Very enlightening. And we now would have five minutes to discuss this pillar as a pillar courses, because we move on to the next pillar. So my question would be to the panelists or any questions to our goals. We have one question from the audience. What are the most common reasons for child sexual abuse in non-pedophilic individuals? That's a very a good question because um, um, we have around 60% of um, the offenses against uh, children are done by non-pedophilic uh, person. Uh, we would uh, see personality disorders in these um, um, persons and um, diminished um, intelligence is another reason. And then um, adolescents are acting out uh, without being uh, inclined. And then we have a problematic uh, group of perpetrators coming from a problematic family structures. And uh, you will find a lot of um, kind of damages done against children, not only sexual abuse, but emotional abuse, physical um, abuse and neglect. So these four groups we can uh, describe. So are there questions to uh, Janvi and Maximilian? I would have one question uh, to Janvi. Can you explain in a few words <laughs> the cultural problems in India? Because very obviously, um, yeah, the, the um, impact is not so high, right? Uh, yes, I mean, I also actually want to add to the earlier question. In India, uh, the non-pedophilic group, group of offenders, we also see a lot of manifestation of power difference. The adults trying to assert that they are more powerful than the children, and the children have no wife or agency in their lives. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and the cultural differences are a lot more complicated to answer in a few words, but one of the biggest difficulties that we have faced is actually the taboo around the topic of sexuality. We, in all our work until now, we've noticed that people find it extremely difficult to talk about their sexual preferences and behaviors and ideas and fantasies in general, so to open up to anyone about it. So all of it is happens behind closed doors, which is why online tools and mobile health, all of that are very useful. And uh, help seeking behavior around this topic is also a limitation. Besides the legal implications that we have spoken about, so, uh, people with pedophilia are afraid that we will report them to the authorities, which we, if they have if, in general, because they are it's a it's preference that's not acceptable, it's too stigmatized. So that has been some of the difficulties that we faced. Thank you. Berit, one question from you. Yeah, I just had a question to both of you, actually. Um, first of all, to congratulate for this great work. I think it's really very few people who work um, on therapies of offenders, and we really, really need uh, this work. Um, but you both mentioned, and Janavi just mentioned it again, an issue um, which is mandatory reporting. And I want to ask your advice, what, what would be your suggestion? I, I know it's a challenge for, for, for many issues or many health services. What, what would be your suggestion? How should 
countries uh, or what kind of legislation should countries have? Should they not have a mandatory reporting law at all? Um, is there some other option? What would be your advice um, given uh, your experience? Maximilian. Okay. Um, well, I cannot speak, of course, for all countries of the world and then suggest things, but um, I just want to underline that there is, um, of course, also mandatory reporting in Germany, but the way it is defined is different. So there, there's more kind of a window of opportunity where things that happened in the past when someone is seeking, seeking help do remain uh, within this therapy patient confidentiality. And uh, this does not necessarily mean, of course, that justice is not sought or that the therapist is not actively working on, on the things that happened in the past, but um, it gives this window of opportunity. But of course, if there's an imminent threat and so on, there is um, a duty to report. But these, these are, you know, this is fine, fine adjusted due to the history of Germany as well with, you know, uh, Nazism and so on that there was a, a very specific focus on um, confidentiality in such settings. And the, yeah, and I think um, generally from a political point of view, it's very difficult to argue against mandatory reporting, but one should have a look at whether people show up at all and how many people are reported at all and take these numbers for discussion, whether it's, there is an opportunity to create, to widen this window without of course, um, entirely throwing away the idea of reporting individuals that have done something illegal. That, that, that of course, uh, may not be opportunistic from a political point of view, but you know, widening that window as a strategy, I think, is best uh, taking into account uh, available numbers of whether this actually leads to something, having these mandatory reporting requirements. Thanks. Jamni, would you like to yeah. add something? Yes, I, I, I would agree with Maximilian. I think the point about imminent risk or current risk is an important one to consider for any reporting law or, or if they are just uh, stigmatizing and pushing away help seekers who might, which might stop us from having more victims in our means to protect one child too, from a past behavior. So I think that's something that definitely needs to be considered in any uh, political rules and legal implications. For it. And um, to say the truth, in India, you have a very strong mandatory report law, but you don't have any reports, <laughs> you know, sure. it, yeah. without any effectiveness. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And the, just the idea that even after reporting, the legal system, the execution of it is not mm. ideal which then makes it pushes the potential offenders or offenders away from health and is still not supportive of the victim in the long run, so. Okay, thank you, Janvi and Maximilian. And now we um, should move on to the next pillar and um, discuss intercepting transmission pathways. So uh, we know, we all know uh, the technologies are available on a global scale first, and uh, even countries with very different social and economic systems and levels of development are connected to a previously unimaginable extent. And the technology is affordable, accessible, and does not constitute an obstacle for uh, offenders. So it's very easy to view, store, and distribute child abuse images. And then I, I must say, these technologies has been taken up by an enormous numbers of children who have become more advanced users uh, under the age of 14 years um, uh, compared to their parents. And in my eyes, it's a very vulnerable uh, target uh, group uh, for online child sexual exploitation. And the activities are uh, at the moment not uh, regulated, but we, we have to discuss this. And I'm really happy um, that uh, Susie Hargreaves is with us and will talk about uh, the increasing numbers of child sexual exploitation material on the internet. Uh, she is uh, the chief executive of the Internet um, Watch Foundation since September 
2011. She's a director of the UK Safer Internet Center and an executive board member of the UK Council Internet Safety. Thank you very much for joining us, Susie. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the previous speakers. It's very interesting. And I'll try and reflect some of what you said in the numbers that I'm about to share. So um, let me uh, just share my screen with you. So hopefully you can all see that. Yeah. Yeah. OK, great. So um, good morning. Um, I'm Susie Hargreaves. I'm from the Internet Watch Foundation. And we have um, a mission to eliminate online child sexual abuse. Um, so um, basically, in terms of what we do, um, child sexual abuse content can be created in one country. So a child can be sexually abused in one country and filmed. That content is then hosted maybe in another country by the internet company. And then it's um, viewed by people in countries all over the world. And our job is the bit in the middle. So we go after the, where the content is hosted and we get it removed. So um, I'm not going to go through all of these, except to say, I think in relation to what people were saying previously, that one of the key principles behind the IWF, and we're an independent organisation, independent of law enforcement and the government, but work closely with both, is that we provide a safe place for people to anonymously report child sexual abuse. And we now do that in 48 countries, including actually in India. So we have uh, reporting portals in countries where they have nowhere for people to report. Obviously, there's a huge having a portal is the easy bit. Getting people to report is the hard bit because people have to trust, particularly when they report to us, that we they can report anonymously or they can actually leave their details if they want to know what happens to their report. And the whole point of this and the principle behind it is that the scale of what we're trying to deal with is so huge that actually we want to stop people and want them to actually think about their behavior before it goes too far. So we want to encourage people to report. We don't share any information with the police whatsoever on people who report. Uh, the only information we share to, with the police is on victim identification. So when we see a new child, and the majority of the images we see are not new children, they're duplicates, we will then immediately escalate that and see if there's a way in which either maybe that child hasn't been identified previously uh, and therefore help to get that child safeguarded. Uh, we're funded by the internet industry and you hear a lot of criticism about the internet industry, but the reality is that when it comes to child sexual abuse, you know, you cannot resolve the issue of child sexual abuse online without working with the internet industry. And we work very closely with them. Um, they uh, pay for us to run our hotline and they take our technical services to disrupt the distribution of child sexual abuse. And you'll see some of the biggest names in the world there. That's not to say the in internet industry cannot do more. I am not going to sit here and just defend the internet industry, but there's an awful lot that they do. And you're gonna hear from Dave in a minute in relation to Facebook's work. That, you know, that people don't realise. And actually, this is about a partnership approach. We have to work together. So I was just going to spend my remaining time just giving you a sense of the scale of the problem. So um, the IWF, obviously, we're removing content from the open web. Um, there's a, a myth that all child sexual abuse is on the dark web. In fact, the majority of uh, child sexual abuse is available on the open web. That doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of, in fact, the, one of the, some of the worst content on the dark web. And in fact, a lot of the images we find on the dark web, we're able to remove because they're actually hosted on the open web. So um, let me just give you a sense of what's been happening in terms of numbers. So the numbers go up every single year. Two reasons for that. One is that uh, more people have access to child sexual abuse internationally. And the second is we're actually getting better at finding it and bringing it down. So with the use of technology like crawlers, like uh, hash lists, which are digital fingerprints, where we can go and find duplicates, we are finding more and more content. So uh, I, that is nothing to be proud of, really, because we would really like to get to the point where, where I can come and say, do you know, we didn't find any child sexual abuse last year. And that's just not going to happen. And uh, then you have throw in the mix issues like uh, COVID. So it was interesting to hear the statistic from before. So in the UK, before uh, lockdown, the National Crime Agency's estimate of the number of people who were uh, 
accessing child sexual abuse online in the UK alone was about 100,000. They immediately upped that amount to 300,000 and they're now suggesting it's around 500,000 people at any, you know, who have a sexual interest in children in the UK. So um, let's look at the headlines from 2020. So we assessed to just under 300,000 reports and uh, these are all assessed by human moderators. Um, we actually found and removed 153,000 web pages of child sexual abuse. Now, when you, that's just web pages, but actually each web page could contain one or a hundred or even thousands of images. So that equates to us removing millions of images. 44% of what we removed last year was what we termed self-generated imagery. And I'm actually going to talk about that in my next slide. Um, on a really positive level, for us in the UK, less than 0.1% of child sexual abuse is hosted in the UK. Um, compared that to what we found 77% of what we removed last year was hosted in the Netherlands. Now, that's not because the Netherlands is inherently bad. It's that content is hosted in countries that have an internet infrastructure. But it is also true that you have a number of bad players in certain countries who will find a home there and will be particularly bad in terms of hosting stuff. Uh, un, un, you know, unsurprisingly, .com was the most abused top level domain. And the, the amount of children we saw, the majority of the ones we saw were 11 to 13. And that's changed drastically over the last few years. And that is because of the massive increase in self-generated content. Um, this will not surprise you to know that the majority of the ch children we see are girls. So it is a, a, a pretty much a gendered crime. So 93% of the content we removed last year was of uh, girls. That does not mean that boys are not sexually abused, and that does not minimise the trauma to boys who are sexually abused. But this is predominantly a violence against girls issue for us. Um, <clears throat> And then obviously I just wanted to show you this, which is about the age and the severity of abuse. So in the UK, what happens when we get content is we classify it A, B or C according to UK sentencing law, A being the very worst level of uh, abuse, which includes rape and sexual torture. And um, over the each time we get an image, if it's a new image, we then hash it. So we apply this digital fingerprint on it. And the digital fingerprint we use to then go out and search for matches to have them removed. We also provide that to industry to do the same thing. And one of the things we do is we analyze and assess <clears throat> the hashes. And one of the most shocking statistics is that the younger the child, the worse the level of abuse that we see. That's pretty much what that slide says. Um, so my final slide is just to talk about self-generated or first-person produced child sexual abuse imagery. And there is a lot of discussion at the moment about the terminology we use here, because, and we haven't got it right yet. So I'm, so, you know, I'm, I'm sorry if, if it sounds like um, we are in any way victim blaming, because we're not. This is child sexual abuse where the child is a victim. But let me just explain to you what we see. In 2012, we started seeing a new kind of content, which was children in their bedrooms and domestic settings. And they've got a tablet, they've got an internet enabled device, it's got a camera, and we're seeing one side of that interaction. And we're seeing that these children are um, tricked, coerced, encouraged to share and engage in sexual activity. And this has just exploded in terms of the amount of content that we're seeing. And of course, they, they are interacting on lots of different uh, sites. Um, by the time we see it, that has been captured and then it's found its way onto a child sexual abuse website. So we don't see it in its original source. We're dealing with that issue after the event. So the crime has already been committed. In 20, uh, 2020, we saw 44% of the content we removed. And in 2021, so far, in the first nine months of 2021, Two thirds of all the content we have removed has been self-generated or first person produced child sexual abuse imagery. So these are predominantly girls aged 11 to 13. And clearly at the age of 11 to 13, they are not emotionally or physically mature enough to know the extent of what is happening. And, and it is a massive concern for us because it's increasing year on year. And at the same time, we've also started seeing the children getting younger. So we saw an increase in seven to 10 year olds. And the reason I raise this is because 
one of the things you've been talking about is the impact of, of uh, sexual abuse on children and on their lives as they grow up. And we've, we don't know yet what the impact of this is going to be on these children, but we clearly have an enormous issue in terms of how we support these children. And I also want to say, just before I finish, that this covers a range of images where you will see children who are clearly in distress being coerced, right through to, to children who are actively engaging in the process. So it's, it, you know, we need to find ways to, we are working and we're doing a national campaign at the moment, working with children and with parents and carers because they clearly don't know what their children are doing and uh, finding ways to acknowledge there is a whole range of harms going on within that, but that whatever the motivation or what happens behind it, these children are victims and they need to be supported. And, you know, our job is to remove the content, but we're really interested in what people uh, are going to do about ways to support these children and ensure that they're safeguarded in the future. So I think that's it from me. Thank you very much. And thanks for the time and the ability to share our work today. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Um, very interesting and I must say quite shocking data. Um, so we, we really have to discuss this um, pillar of the pandemic. It, it's very obvious. Um, that this is a transmission path. And I'm really happy that we have Dave with us. Um, he will talk about transmission paths of sexual traumatization, so it fit uh, excellent. And he's very experienced um, with technology and uh, the telecommunication sector. Um, he's currently uh, the head of uh, safety uh, at Facebook for Europe, Middle East and Africa, and a member of the We Protect Global Alliance 2021. And uh, he's the director of, um, for Europe, Middle East and Africa of FOSI, uh, which stands for Family Online Safety Institute. And this is an international nonprofit organization which works to make the online safer for kids and their families. Thank you, Dave, for joining us. Please. Go ahead. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Baer, and, uh, and great to, to be here today. Um, and, and so firstly, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Um, it's also great to be with some of our most trusted and valued partners, including the Internet Watch Foundation. And indeed, thank you to a charity for hosting um, this, uh, this session. Uh, in this part of the session, you've asked how we intervene in the transmission pathways. And I think it's useful to provide some context given the broad audience of health professionals listening in. I'll not do slides, this will be an intervention and I'm very happy to take questions. In the first quarter of 2021, 3.51 billion people used Facebook's family of apps. That includes Facebook, WhatsApp and Instagram. And as you've probably seen from recent announcements around our investments in the metaverse, there is a whole new era coming as well. So what we see now will change dramatically over the years and the line between on, offline, on and offline will change fundamentally. Facebook considers child safety one of our most important responsibilities and we do not tolerate any behavior or content that exploits children online. And we continue to work tirelessly and although our community standards ban child exploitation, to avoid the potential for abuse, we take action on non-consensual content as well, like benign photos of children in the bath. And we do this predominantly through proactive scanning technology, um, and we remove 99% of the content that's on our platform before users even see it. With this comprehensive approach, according to NICMEC's 2020 annual report, cyber tip reports, increased 29% last year, we were 21.5 million of that number. So we're 94% of the world scanning. And I think that's something to consider that for all the platforms in the world, um, the remaining six, the, the remaining industry only accounts for 6% of scanning. So from an industry perspective, there's still a lot of the, um, the, the public services of the internet that is still not scanned and is not still not proactively scanned in that way. And that is a deep concern. We've specifically trained teams with backgrounds in law, law enforcement, online safety analytics and forensic investigations, which review content and report findings to NICMEC. And NICMEC 
works with law enforcement agencies around the world to help victims. And we're helping the organization develop new software to help prioritize the reports it shares with law enforcement in order to address the most serious cases first. And that's particularly important because law enforcement often doesn't have the capacity um, and indeed hotlines and helplines struggle with that issue too. So it's really important to get that sense of priority. For context, however, according to Inho, the global CSAM hotline um, network, only 1% of com content they actually originated from social media. So this is an internet wide problem. And this speaks to a need for an industry wide multi stakeholder approach to thwart the sharing of this heinous content. Our work with the Technology Coalition, the We Protect Global Alliance, as a leading signatory of the voluntary principles to tackle CSAM is indicative of the collaborative approach we take. And I know the Internet Watch Foundation as a center of excellence is core to that too. But it's also worth digging behind the numbers. For some time, our data scientists have been analyzing these reports. And in October and November of 2020, we did a major exercise to contextualize these numbers in partnership with NICMEC. We found during that period that 90% of content reported to Nick Beck on Facebook and Instagram was the same or visually similar to previously reported content in the same period. In other words, a small number of images represent a large majority of the images shared and reshared and reported. To put a finer point on it, in October, November, for example, just six pieces of visually distinct media were responsible for half of the content reported to NICMEC via Facebook and Instagram. Each share of an image remains, of course, a horrible re-victimization, but this information may suggest different solutions. Using an intent taxonomy developed with experts, including NICMEC, we're doing targeted labeling by experience, uh, targeted labeling of experienced investigators of our cyber tips. And our initial review has discovered that there is a very large proportion of content that's shared that is non-malicious in intent and not shared by people with a sexual interest in children. Why is intent important? There's a wide range of reasons why people shared child nudity or platforms of some abuse, but we do think that a lot of it is through curiosity, um, outrage, poor humor. But without understanding the harms and the causes, while other malicious actors are working, we really need to get to the heart of that. And understanding those differences is really key. And finally, what I want to talk about is non stopping non-malicious sharing of, uh, at scale must be done with awareness and education tactics. And understanding the behavior of accounts involved in malicious sharing also helps us to target our internal interventions to prevent and detect, as well as focus on improving and reporting NICMEC reports. And understanding that shift is really important. So as a result of that, we've done three things. We've pushed very heavily over onto the prevention side of what we're doing. And that includes safety alerts and pop-ups pop in, in an app, which we're trying to work on at the moment. And that has produced some really interesting results. And then the other thing too is the sharing and distribution. What has become very evident is there is a very significant shift from the global north to the global south in terms of the sharing and distribution of this content. And really that is quite alarming. And that's reflected in some of the figures that we saw earlier on in India. And to that extent, uh, we're also um, developing and deploying public health campaigns, report it, don't share it, in that region um, to try and tackle those kind of issues. Interestingly enough, in Africa and South America, where we've been applying those in many cases, it's the first time that there have been a public awareness messaging like that in that region. And we're looking at the findings at the moment to see what the impact of those are. So I think that combination of both technology, um, expert moderation and support um, uh, and, and analysis is really key. And uh, we continue to be committed to tackling CSAM in all its forms and very happy to take any questions uh, after this. Thank you so much, Dave. And um, now we should uh, discuss both speakers. I mean, Susie's and Dave's. Um, presentation and my first question would be to the panelists are there any questions from your side is there any research done uh, Susie concerning these um, kind of 
what can I say, disinhibition in the behavior of um, young girls concerning presenting themselves um, and producing these um, self images. Um, so, uh, well, I can go first if that's okay. So um, I, I think we, we need to do a lot more research. In fact, actually, we've just um, formed a partnership with Anglia Ruskin University here in Cambridge, where we're going to have a PhD student working with us over the next three years, actually focusing exactly on this issue. So uh, because uh, I think there is a, a kind of a, a gap between um, the sort of practice and what we're seeing and the kind of academic research to back it up and I think we need to have some more evidence based so there's lots of there's lots of assumptions so I can we can say well we see children and we think that this is happening but it's it's not grounded in um, robust research so hopefully uh, by working with academic partners we can start to address that a bit more um, we are also doing in fact we, we're doing a project which Facebook have kindly supported the technology for actually with the NSPCC in the UK, uh, which is a project where um, young people can self refer images of themselves to get them removed without fear of criminalization, because one of the issues we've been um, tackling is it's very hard for young people to come forward because in effect they've sometimes committed a crime so. So we so we've been working with the police, with NECMEC in the states, with our government to put in a reporting loop where we support young people, and uh, working very closely together to do that. But I think you know we're we're all aware we're seeing this really big problem, but we need a bit of sort of academic rigor behind it to really start understanding and tackling some of the underlying issues. Thank you, Susie. We have one question from the audience. Uh, Susie, you mentioned where the materials are hosted and David, where it is shared. Do you have any indication of where the content is predominantly produced? Uh, well, I'll go first again, Dave, if you want to kick in. I mean, the issue is everywhere, everywhere. Children are sexually abused everywhere. And, you know, I mean, the sad reality, I guess, because we are working um, in, in the West is that, you know, we see a lot of white children, uh, Caucasian children, I guess that's because people, that's what people are looking for themselves, um, you know, and we are, we are starting, and we know that children in terms of live streaming that we're talking about where we're looking at the, there's an economic factor, we're looking at um, children often from the Philippines, but that's not what we're seeing. We didn't, we thought we would start seeing live streaming captured and we would start seeing that but we don't really see that and I think again it's anecdotal I think one of the reasons behind it is that it's 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 kind of disgustingly so cheap to mm -hmm. to have children abused live that they don't need to record it um, so there's the whole economic side of live streaming but I I would say children children I don't think any country uh, is has has the kind of monopoly on 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 knowing how not, you know, not to abuse children. I, I would say everywhere, children are potentially at risk, but that means that we all everywhere have to step up and try and fight it together. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, Susie. I think um, in, in prior to joining Facebook, I worked with the We Protect Global Alliance and um, had, had the privilege to work with a number of charities who uh, reached out to the first 17 priority countries, predominantly in the global South, who were being funded through the, um, uh, the UNICEF's um, Fund to End Violence Against Children. And indeed, part of that process was visiting those 17 countries. We certainly went into countries where I would say in certain communities, uh, sexual abuse offline was endemic to that population through poverty, through you know, lots of criminalization, corruption, and so on. And so, and, and, and actually, in many cases was predominantly offline, but was increasingly online. So sometimes what we're seeing is that the online aspect is just the tip of the iceberg. And if you talk to people like ECPAT and others that work in areas like sex trafficking and so on, I think there's another thing that we must have an obligation to address, which is that harms to very young children lead to a lifetime probably of harm and vulnerability. And in doing that, we silo these things into child sexual abuse and into different categories. It's not like that. The, the child that is sexually abused at three or four years old, tragically, 
may go on to be prostituted or trafficked. And so we have to think about it in those holistic terms. And I think that's one of the reasons why fundamentally child sexual exploitation and abuse is so important globally, that as a crime, it is so heinous, it leads to such a lifetime of vulnerability and trauma, that that's the reason why there's the level of focus there needs to be from the international community. And we're only in the foothills of that right now, but I do genuinely believe that's necessary. And to Susie's point, you know, I, I think it's in most countries. I think the other obligation too, I think we have, is to track um, how it globally spreads and make sure that there are, robust, that there are the robust law enforcement and institutional systems in countries to deal with these things. It's no good um, us advocating um, for child sexual exploitation and abuse, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, when underage marriage means that 12 million girls last year were married to much older men underage. And so therefore the attempts to prosecute in those kinds of situations are really difficult. So it is a very complex civil society issue that has to be addressed. And mm. as was mentioned earlier on, there's a lot of taboo around this. There's lots of countries I've dealt with who don't even acknowledge that they've got the problem. And that is also challenging for charities and organizations like ourselves trying to work in those countries where the data tells us that that kind of crime is going on. So a very challenging environment. But I, I am optimistic that it is a global approach. And to Susie's point earlier on, to take a, a, a really holistic approach to it. Thank you, Dave. We are running out of time, but I have one question for you, Dave, uh, if I may. So how do you know that uh, there are so many users of child abuse images who are not pedophilically inclined? Um, well, I think the data science work that we do, and it's ongoing around the non-malicious um, activity, um, we can't share the details of that because inevitably the kind of content that we're dealing with and, and shipped via uh, NICMEX reporting system means that there are very distinct, there are distinct privacy safeguards around revealing that kind of information. Mm -hmm. But we do know that a very significant portion are, are non-malicious. And that's reflected in our discussions with law enforcement as well, where um, they tell us that a significant proportion of what they get are often very similar images um, or the same images and don't lead to contact offending. So we've put those things together. There's clearly a non, very important non-malicious aspect. But that said, you know, even if 10% of that was unique content and it's malicious, that's a horrendous problem given the trauma of each one of those. So I think the, uh, the, the, the smaller number is no, no cause for complacency at all. Hmm. I'm, I'm asking because we need to, to do to run clinical assessment for saying that. And as far as I know, even in the legal field, I mean, those one who are known to the legal authorities that's very seldom um, clinical assessment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's very sad, yeah. All right, thank you so much for discussing this pillar. We will have the chance to do it again at the end of the uh, session, but now I'm happy to announce Berit um, for um, discussing the third pillar. This would be the victims and the survivors and Berit, uh, work as, works as a technical officer of the Violence Prevention Unit in the WHO Department for Social Determinants, Determinants of Health in Geneva. And she develops normative guidelines and provides technical support to countries on strengthening the health sector response to violence against children. But hand over to you, Barrett. Sorry, <laughs> didn't mention, manage to unmute. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's really a privilege to join the session on sexual trauma today. And what I will do is to briefly share um, some data about the prevalence of sexual abuse of children worldwide, and um, also with a particular focus on low and middle income countries, and talk about what can be done to mitigate negative consequences of child sexual abuse in particular from a health sector perspective. So I would like to start by reminding us about the global prevalence of child abuse and neglect, and here in particular sexual abuse, which is on the bottom right. Um, this slide provides an overview of a meta-analysis of prevalence, whereby population-based studies, surveys globally, 
um, were analyzed. And uh, globally, um, the study retrieved that 18% of girls and 8% of boys reported some form of sexual abuse in their childhood. And by, for a very long time, there was a substantial lack of data from low and middle income countries. Um, in the most recent years, a couple of international initiatives made increasing efforts to address this data gap. And one of them you'll see on this slide. So this data is from a partnership, um, which is called Together for Girls, which involves the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US, UNICEF, WHO, and other partners. And we see here data from a range of African, Asian, and Latin American countries. And the slide, as you see, summarizes for each of these countries, the exposure of girls and boys to any form of sexual abuse. And on the next slide, I'll give some more details about what types of sexual abuse are considered. And while we see here a lot of variation between countries, we see, and also in line with the figures that um, Maximilian presented from Europe, that the prevalence throughout is very high. It ranges from four to 38% in girls and from three to 21% in boys. And on this slide, we see for different types of abuse, um, a breakup for four different countries. So it shows um, how many children were affected by a particular subtype of sexual abuse. Um, and the four subtypes that were considered here were forced sex or rape, coerced sex, attempted physically forced sex, and unwanted sexual touching. And what we can see on the right side is that unwanted sexual touching was most frequently reported in all of the four countries. But um, uh, and the prevalence of the subtypes of violence with the lowest rates, um, which were for completed coerced sex and for physically forced sex, still ranged from 3% to 10% in girls and from 1% to 3% in boys, which are still shockingly high numbers. And I just as we focused already on technology, um, just briefly want to touch that technology adds a new dimension to sexual violence. Um, and um, what Susie also mentioned from a public health perspective, this is still an area where we have very limited data um, from the perspective of the individual. It usually comes from few studies, mostly in high income countries, um, but we clearly see that technology changes the threats that children experience. Uh, for example, one in nine children in Europe do report they had unwanted sexual contact online. 15% of children report they were victim of cyberbullying. And what is interesting, what I briefly want to flag is that there's a new initiative underway um, to address the scarcity of data, particularly for low and middle income country, countries, the Disrupting Harm Project, um, which is led by ECPAT, Interpol, and UNICEF Innocenti, the research arm of UNICEF, um, has been underway in the past few years. And to my knowledge, they're public in their first data very soon. They will generate data from 14 countries on their experience of child exploitation online and what surrounds these types of abuse. We already briefly touched um, on the health consequences. Um, we know that child sexual abuse leads to very severe consequences which often have an impact throughout the life. Um, so children who experience sexual abuse have a higher likelihood to suffer mental health problems such as depression, increased risk of suicide. They have a higher risk to contract sexually transmitted infections such as HIV. They show more health risk behaviors such as alcohol and drug use or smoke when they grow up. They have a higher likelihood of having non-communicable diseases such as cardiovascular di diseases or diabetes. And lastly, they also have a higher likelihood to perpetrate violence in adulthood. So what can be done <clears throat> to mitigate um, the negative health outcomes? And I briefly want to address one major barrier to address negative consequence, which we also already heard, is that very few children disclose sexual abuse. So um, children often don't disclose abuse because of stigma, they fear retaliation, 
um, there's there's a lack of existing services or awareness of these services, or they might have had negative consequences with existing support services. And according to population-based data from six different countries, um, less than half of the children that experience sexual abuse told anyone about it, a friend or family member. Um, and only one to 11%, depending on the country, there's a bit of a spread there, um, received any formal help. So 90% of children who were sexually abused did not get any support. And there we also see a clear difference between boys and girls. So boys tend to show much less help seeking behavior than girls. And I think that's an important aspect to consider when we speak about support structures, because very few children will come forward. Um, and I want to briefly highlight three important aspects to strengthen the response to sexual violence and other forms of violence against children. And the first was already touched upon by Susie, um, is to investigate more what works to mitigate negative consequences and how health systems should respond to violence. And here in the last two years, WHO and other partners have done a lot of work to synthesize existing evidence around how to identify survivors of sexual violence, given the low rates of disclosure, what physical, sexual, and psychological health services should be provided and how they should provide it and by whom. And um, I'd suggest you to consult these, these guidelines if you're interested in these aspects. Um, the next important aspect is to strengthen the capacity of healthcare providers and other providers who interact with children on a regular basis to identify and address sexual violence and other forms of violence against children. Given the low rates of disclosure, we recommend that primary care providers are alert to signs and symptoms of abuse. And because in very few cases, this will be the primary reason why children and adolescents seek health service. They will seek health service for another underlying problem. And eventually in the encounter, if it's done in a sensitive way, they might disclose abuse. Um, a problem is that often violence against children is not included in any pre-service curricula or training of healthcare providers. Um, and uh, we recommend that healthcare providers learn, for example, uh, being able to recognize signs and symptoms of abuse that are associated uh, that are associated with sexual violence, and that they learn um, how to, or that they, after a training, will be able to inquire safely about a potential abuse without putting the child at risk. And given that children are often um, accompanied by a caregiver who might have facilitate, facilitated or tolerated the abuse or who might have experienced abuse him or herself, this can be quite a challenging situation. They should also be able to offer appropriate physical, mental and sexual health services. But of course, strengthening health services will not be sufficient to address the problem. We have seen that sexual and other forms of violence against children occur very frequently <clears throat> and will place a lot of demand on health systems if all of the victims will come forward. Um, therefore, the strengthened, strengthened health and support services need to be embedded in a broader approach that focuses on preventing violence against children before occurring in the first place an issue that was already brought up by Maximilian. <clears throat> and here, um, WHO and others um, uh, promote the um, INSPIRE approach. This is an evidence-based package of interventions for implementing effective, comprehensive programming to combat violence. It was created by 10 agencies with a long history of work to address violence against children. It can be a useful framework, I think, to um, integrate response services. INSPIRE, if you haven't heard of it, is an acronym that includes seven distinct strategies, which together make a comprehensive framework to address all forms of violence against children. Uh, and just to highlight a few of them, um, it, for example, encourages laws that ban violence against children, including, for example, laws banning sexual abuse and exploitation of children, so have a proper legal framework. It also emphasizes the import, uh, importance of changing harmful societal norms, for example, norms around sexual entitlement, which have been identified as a risk factor for sexual abuse. And it also suggests um, something mentioned by Susan to, um, to stop, um, to engage parents and caregivers to stop sexual violence against children. 
And lastly, is also considering the role of schools and education settings, which play an important role in prevention. So overall, the response and support services should be embedded in a more comprehensive response to violence against children. Over to you, Dr. Bayer. Thank you so much, Barrett. Excellent, excellent overview. And um, now, are there any questions to Barrett? It's a really huge topic and a huge problem because we can see um, the structures in the healthcare system are not um, elaborated enough. Um, so if I should start, I, I would like to ask, how do you see the chances of uh, mobile health in this um, area? Because we do have data that we can help with remote treatment um, survivors of uh, sexual traumatization. There are very good data, evidence-based uh, trauma-focused therapy will, will work uh, even uh, on a remote way. Um, thank you for that question. So yes, I see a lot of potential there. And I think it's probably also the only chance we have given the large demand. Mm -hmm. um, and what, but I also see it's only in the beginning. So um, the mental health team at WHO, for example, they have started to develop chatbots for uh, common mental health problems, and they have shown to, to be quite effective. What we are doing is uh, to develop um, uh, training and online training to um, help healthcare providers to participate uh, from a distance and detect all types of child abuse and neglect. So they will be confronted with certain scenarios um, uh, and will have to take certain decisions. And that is something that, that will come out um, early next year. But um, we, are, we are only slowly starting to explore this space. And I think there's a lot of potential and probably a lot more to do. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions from the panelists? Then maybe we should move on to uh, the perspectives and have the chance at the end to discuss the whole pandemic issue. And um, so our last speaker uh, will be Stephen uh, Shaw. Um, he's from Australia and a former restaurateur and MBA lecturer. And now he's working with the William von Humboldt Foundation and the new founded Prevention Alliance. We will talk about this, and he's very much engaged at the moment in the establishment of Don't, Don't Offend Network in Australia. So, Stephen, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Bayer, and um, thank you to the previous speakers who have been incredibly enlightening. And I, I guess I need to warn that there may be one or two pieces of content here that people might find challenging. You know, the, the threads of our lives take us on various paths. And I had no idea uh, when I married a survivor of child sexual abuse that it would inform so much of uh, my future endeavors. Nor did I realize when um, a teacher at my children's school was arrested and uh, charged and jailed for possessing child sexual abuse material that it would trigger a few thoughts in me. Firstly, how those people who engage in the viewing of material are creating a demand for the production of material. You would think as a restaurateur, I would know that, that without customers, you don't have a product. Um, but further than that, it made me think of an inflection point. The person who committed these crimes was actually a part of a community that I was very involved with. His grandparents and my grandparents came to Australia together. So those very personal thoughts made me think about him as a human being. How until the point where he committed the first offense of looking at this material, he actually was an incredibly virtuous person. He had this urge and had managed to hold himself back from committing a crime. I found that incredibly brave. But at the stroke of a keypad, he became someone who indulged in a crime that I couldn't think of a worse one because of the long lasting effects 
through the lives and the flow and effects through other people's lives. And I couldn't think of another inflection point in a human's life where they can go from someone so virtuous to someone with so much to answer for. And it made me think about what we could do to help people who were being brave to stop themselves from moving to uh, commit those crimes. And that led me to search the world and land at uh, Project Dunkelfeld and Professor Bayer and his team. And together we've discussed ways in which my philanthropy and uh, skill set could help uh, spawn better programs to increase the spread of the work that's done in prevention, particularly through troubled desire. You know, when we think of these crimes, we've been using generic terms, child sexual abuse material, and uh, I thought of perhaps introducing one of the websites that's been problematic, and it was called uh, Baby Heart. And then I thought to myself, if I ask you to visualize the work that's done inside a website like that and the product that's created, it might be actually too much. And it might be unethical for me to ask you to even think about what that content might be. So in doing so, it made me think further, if it's unethical to even consider what the crime looks like, imagine how difficult that crime is to even deal with and how severe that crime is. And in doing so, in developing the strategy that we have for our pilot program that's coming, we've, had, we've faced various challenges. We've surveyed through our partners and uh, key people that we know and found that obviously the challenge is funding and also getting public and political support. That's been difficult because one generally leads to the other. Without funding, you can't do that and vice versa. Project Dunkelfeld has a small advantage insofar as we do have a great uh, acceptance by public and uh, political entities, and we do have a small pool of funding which we draw upon to help further our work. But still, there is so much to do. The landscape and jurisdictions that we operate in is different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but also within the countries that we operate. And so in Australia, we have multiple jurisdictions with multiple uh, work around the uh, mandatory reporting laws, for instance, which can, as we've discussed and as you've seen in the presentation so far, has both positive and negative consequences. We also are catching up with technology constantly. Um, if you think of a site like OnlyFans, which is very topical at the moment, that we're told has been a, a, a game changer for sex, for adult sex workers, who don't get their content ex exploited by third parties who deal direct with uh, their clients. And we see that necessarily, or it's promoted to us as a positive. Of course, this becomes an incredibly problematic piece of technology when we think how it's used uh, nefariously by coerced or self-produced um, underage. Public and private partnerships are, of course, have been a buzzword for a long time, and that produces a challenge for us as well. We have good relationships with government entities, but government entities very often see this as something where we should be supported by the uh, networks where the content is produced. That might be a logical thing for them to say, and everyone has been contributing, and you've heard other speakers here today talk about the generosity of, of, um, of people in those areas. But the fact of the matter is there are a lot of us that are cooperating with each other, doing the best that we can to share information and strategy and data. But when it comes down to looking for resources, sometimes we're competitors. And that produces a pressure point for all of us who are trying to achieve improvement in the industry. Coordination then is a very important part of what we do. And the William von Humboldt Foundation coming up with Act Against Child Abuse is a very important part of bringing the resources together so that we have the least amount of duplication and the greatest impact for the resources that we share. So down to the pilot program in Australia. Why Australia? Well, um, uh, we have resources in English that make Australia a, one of the logical choices. There's a very, very high prevalence of this criminal activity in Australia. 
Um, I know it's a global problem. It seems that Australia is one of the many hotspots. We are a gateway to Southeast Asia. And again, that makes us a key link in the chain. There is very good government awareness and community awareness in Australia. And for that, we're very, very fortunate. It may just be because there's more uh, prevalence of um, engagement and more publicity and more awareness, but at least that gives us a foothold to start with getting our program off the ground. What our program is, basically it's a few pillars that come together. We're going to use our resources to train specialist practitioners in Australia. We're in the process of recruiting them now, and we're finding that practitioners are generally very interested in adding our specific training and the reputation that we have to their suite of, of um, uh, activities. We will use our infrastructure to attract and assess patients and deliver them to those practitioners. That sounds easy to say, but attracting uh, and assessing potential patients requires all the skill set that my colleagues in Germany have. We'll be working very hard to do so, and we have, we think we have plenty of channels in which we can do that and get the key number, the critical mass of patients to make the study uh, effective of the pilot to see that we have an ongoing process. So let's assume that we can get all of that done and it's a great assumption and we're very uh, optimistic that we can get that done. And um, we have the resources, the monetary resources as well through philanthropy that we will be able to put the pilot program through. From there, it's about rolling out the process in Australia and then getting a critical mass of international locations. The critical mass of international locations becomes a part of what the William von Humboldt Foundation and Act Against Child Abuse is going to use to share data across jurisdictions and be able to fine tune and do better with what we offer and how we put this action into process. So in doing so, we hope to get to that critical mass by 2028, 20, 2029 and that, uh, that year. If we get to that critical mass at that stage and refine the processes, we're confident that we can achieve a global rollout sometime around 2045, 2050. The global rollout won't mean uh, a central nexus of uh, Act Against Child Abuse directing activities worldwide. What it means is that each country will have its independent way of monitoring how they need to implement the data that we collect centrally and redistribute out to our, um, our uh, centres around the world. So it's a combination of uh, central intelligence and remote local uh, intervention. Now, this all sounds fabulous. It sounds fabulous to me because I'm involved, but I have to be realistic and we all need to be realistic about what we're doing. We are helping the small percentage of those who want help, who've yet to commit a crime, to get the help that they need to stop themselves, like that teacher in my life, from committing the first crime. I'm confident we can do that. I'm confident we can save children's lives. And as you've seen, there are so many people working in so many different facets of this industry that we're very lucky that together we're going to make at least a very serious impact into the problem. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Stephen. So um, I think it's very clear that we are facing a pandemic situation, uh, but the future of a pandemic depends on whether it is recognized as such, including the associated consequences and whether efforts are made to contain it by society as well through international cooperation. So I would like to use the last 10 minutes around now only six minutes left uh, to motivate you to think about how can we change uh, the focus on child sexual abuse and the use of child abuse images to a global health issue. How could that be done? How can we motivate political influence to change the view on this um, problem and to give the same, or I, I would say, um, sufficient resources, resources uh, in, in dealing with this pandemic. 
because compared to the COVID pandemic, it's really a very small fraction and tackling this, this uh, problem. Any ideas from the panelists? Uh, Dr. Baer, could I sort of make a, a sort of broader point, which is I think um, getting us into a state of readiness to, to follow these sort of kind of public health models. And I just think listening to the really interesting presentations today, I think we currently have a, a what I would call a capacity and competency deficit compared to the increases in, in, in reports. And I think if you look at the capacity problems that not just only hotlines face in terms of funding and and training staff, but law enforcement and just having enough prosecutors, for example, to prosecute cases that often take many, many years. That's we have right. huge shortfalls in those kind of areas. I think that's really important. I think technology can provide part of the answer. So we're working with Tech Matters to sort of uh, provide a uh, tech infrastructure to hotlines and helplines um, in countries where they're often underfunded. Uh, we're open sourcing photo and video matching technology to smaller players. Um, is another example. And obviously I work with the case management tool with NICMAC. So they're all capacity building issues. Um, I think the other thing that strikes me too is that there are multiple hash lists and Susie will speak to this more than me, but you know there isn't a universal standard in terms of hash lists. So even if we were to take a global approach, there isn't agreement in many areas, not just technical, but in terms of the way we store this uh, terrible uh, content. And I think it speaks to the final thing, I think, which is, I just, it would be, I think there needs to be new metrics. Right now, we don't know from report to prosecution what those numbers look like. No idea. And we actually don't know what the capacity levels are in those areas. So I think it's certainly something that I would advocate for, and we're talking about this within, within Facebook, um, is, you know, how do you just take that total pathway and build that out? And I think that's really important. And if you can establish those metrics, then um, you can then lean in better to a public health um, kind of position where you've got a good evidence base and you, you've got a, a, a global measurement structure. Now that may take many years to do because it involves a lot of stakeholders, but I think that's something that we need, um, uh, genuinely need to sort of really deal with the issue. Just my thoughts. Susie. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I mean, one of the things I think this um, panel has just sort of um, demonstrated how it's how important that every aspect of the value chain is and the importance of working together. And, uh, you know, I think I think what we have is also, I think generally those of us who work in this area, whether it's from a kind of a preventative or a moving content that was working with people who suffered from the trauma of its working with the perpetrators. I think we all understand that we all need to work together, but we still have, it's, it's, it's still not, you know, politically and certainly in the UK, you know, there's still a kind of, you know, lock them up and throw away the key approach. And it's very intolerant. And, uh, you know, and, and it's ridiculous. The numbers we have are just crazy. And actually, but, you know, it, it's, it, it doesn't play into the nice, easy political message that actually, we need to invest in this. We cannot put everybody in prison who looks at an image of child sexual abuse. It's ridiculous. I mean, we've already got a ridiculously large prison population and we don't invest in rehabilitation. So what we're going to do, bung them in prison for a year and then let them out to, you know, just continue. I mean, it's, it's just ludicrous. So we need to find a way, you know, and, and, and I think the sad thing is that, that politically it just doesn't play out. So uh, so I don't know how we get that message across um, when we are all pretty much on the same page. Thank you. That's, that's my feeling as well. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. So the question would be how, well, the additional question would be how can we combine efforts across all these three pillars? And this might be not possible without strong political support, I guess. Berit, would you like to add something at the end? Because we are yeah. we only have left one minute. Sorry for that. No, no, maybe, maybe to add on a, on a positive note. I mean, I'm observing the field since uh, the past 10 years. And um, I think uh, the issue has been much higher on the, on the public health agenda as it has been 10 years ago. 
Um, and I just want to remind us that this year, the World Health Assembly even adopted a new resolution to strengthen the health sector response to all forms of violence against children, including sexual violence. So there is a strong government commitment which we can use. Um, and in line with what um, David and Susie said, I think uh, we are still, um, the field is still a bit um, scattered. So some people focus on, on only on sexual violence, some people on child maltreatment in general, then there's an overlap with violence against women, some focus on online violence only. And I think it would be helpful if we all send the same strong messages, ideally backed up by strong data and evidence and have a sort of investment case, what we can achieve when we all work together to end sexual violence. Great closing remarks, Barrett. Thank you so, thank you so much. And um, I'm really excited by um, your uh, votes and speeches. And I hope that we can uh, contribute in um, this direction and work together in, in the future. So we have to uh, end up this session uh, at the spot. Now it's 10.31. Thank you so much. And Hope to see you next time soon. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.